Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, Western foreign policy has been uh, based on two mistaken assumptions. The first was that we could get the Chinese and Russian regimes to accept and embrace the liberal international order through the creation of interdependence via trade, dissemination of technical know-how, and membership of international institutions. The West's decision to integrate China in the global economic order made them wealthier and more powerful, while the relative strength of the West shrank. The European policy was one of integrating Russia into international structures, and it was more, most forcefully advocated by Germany. Some of you may remember Angela Merkel's catchphrase, Wandel durch Handel, transformation through trade. This uh, Ostpolitik precluded tough sanctions on Russia after their invasions of Georgia and Crimea and resulted in a German and European energy dependency on Russia, which now finances Putin's war machine in Ukraine. The second assumption, mainly practiced by the US, but certainly not without support in Europe, mea culpa, I was one of them 15 years ago, was to make the world safe for democracy through military intervention and nation building. We tried to transform China and Russia into liberal, rule-abiding democracies. It didn't work. We tried nation building in Afghanistan. It didn't work. We tried to foster democracy in the Middle East. It didn't work. At the end of its 30-year run, liberal foreign policy has precious little to show for its efforts and has, in hindsight, proven to be dangerously naive. This is why we need something that could be described as principled realism, a conservative pursuit of realism with a moral compass based on our Judeo-Christian values. Ladies and gentlemen, China does not lecture other countries on human rights, corruption, and democracy. They offer cheap loans to countries in Asia, Africa, Latin, and South America through their Belt and Road Initiative. And, dare I say it, even some of the EU's member states have found it enticing to take these loans. We may not see the allure of the Chinese offer whether it's uh, authoritarianism or Belt and Road, but not so few leaders do. These offers come with strings attached and often give the Chinese political leverage as well as substantial control over the country's natural resources and or infrastructure. But the Western package is also not without provisions. The EU's alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative, our program on international spending on infrastructure to gain economic and political influence and to, I quote, shape globalization the European way, end quote, is dubbed the global gateway. The initiative offers lower income countries green, transparent, and values-based project financing. Many poor countries, I think we must be honest about this, especially their leaders, their elites, will find the Chinese offer and their non-intervention in domestic affairs more attractive than the EU alternative, especially if it comes with inept Western efforts to force woke morphs on their traditional cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, the foundation of the liberal internationalist foreign policy is the belief in the end of history. Utopianism. Many believe that with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, history has woken up. I contend that it never went to sleep. The illusion that China was committed to free markets, tolerance, and self-determination is long gone. Its genocidal persecution of Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang, 
their belligerence towards Taiwan, their cover-up, lies, and mishandling of the COVID-19 outbreak, the personality cult of Xi Jinping, and the Orwellian social credit system. People from all across the political spectrum find aspects of the CCP rule they deem outright repulsive. Long term, the West cannot rely or closely cooperate with countries that seek to undermine our interests and democratic institutions. If the West is to win a new Cold War-esque direct challenge from Red China, we will need to re-examine and strengthen all aspects of transatlantic cooperation, as well as our cooperation with like-minded partners around the world. Sadly, many in the EU institutions don't see things this way and want to make Europe an independent power in the international system, balancing between China and the US. The EU Council President Charles Michel expressed this sentiment when he said that, uh, and I quote, the EU must not become collateral damage between the US and China, unquote. Charles Michel's uh, statement shows that he does not believe that the US and the EU are partners, but competitors in our policies towards China. This is a grave strategic error. Fellow conservatives, if Michel had his way, the EU would opt for strategic autonomy, adopting a supranational foreign policy and EU army and do without the transatlantic alliance. It isn't likely that uh, the US long term will continue to subsidize European security and take European interests into consideration if the EU acts as a competitor undermining US strategic interests. The preference of the power-hungry EU bureaucracy as well as the French leadership are for going it alone. But trying to balance China and the US as an independent actor will undoubtedly leave Europe weaker and more isolated. This is why principled realism is more needed than ever. Rather than woke ideas, we need to pursue realism with a moral compass based on our principles of freedom, human dignity, and the oft-forgotten virtue of prudence. If you believe in the nation state as the cornerstone of international order and law, the obvious choice, and the one that I believe most European countries will want, is to strengthen the transatlantic alliance. And uh, we should work with the US, NATO, the Quad, AUKUS, and democracies such as Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea in the Asian region to counter Russia, China, and their new dominions. The EU, NATO, the US, the UK, and other important democracies should form, in lack of a uh, better word, a Western alliance. Such an alliance should be based on policies of principled realism and reverse the policy of integration and mutual dependence with our competitors and potential enemies. This means, in practice, decoupling supply chains for critical resources and reviewing rules for Chinese ownership and investment in our part of the world. However much we supported free trade in the past, and I, for one, has, have always been a free trader, we now need to decouple from hostile states and locate critical supply chains to countries not in direct competition with the West. India comes to mind here. It also means that no Western democracy should take money from or participate in China's Belt and Road initiatives. Though those that do risk being used by Beijing to weaken us. Furthermore, it will require countries limiting the ownership of Chinese firms. Volvo cars in my own country is a case in point. Now, I'm not going to lie, I'm a proud Volvo owner, 
and I recognize that Chinese ownership through Geely galvanized Volvo after the stale years of Ford ownership. But it is time to wake up and smell the coffee. Chinese ownership of Western Sweden's growth engine number one enables Beijing to blackmail any Swedish government. To my fellow uh, Europeans, some don't like to admit it, but European countries will never be central players in Asia. What the European countries can do is to assist in a free and cooperative Asia is somewhat counterintuitively to strengthen our own defense. If the European states can carry their own weight in Europe, it would allow the United States to focus on the Pacific. We have a, a very recent example of why this is important. During the first weeks of the Russian invasion into Ukraine, many feared that the United States' failure to prepare for two wars could entice China to take the opportunity for a fait accompli invasion of Taiwan. Many worried that the regime in Beijing would view the non-response to the takeover of Hong Kong in the same way that Moscow viewed the non-reaction to Crimea, and that Taiwan would follow in the same way as Ukraine followed. Those that want Europe to have a greater role in the world would also stand to gain from this strategy. If the European countries paid our own way and didn't free ride on U.S. defense spending, Europe would be a more valued and, yes, equal partner with a seat at the table when issues were decided. Finally, in the same way NATO is a defensive alliance essentially uh, tasked for preventing an attack from Russia, we need a trade NATO as a defensive alliance of dem democratic states willing to defend member states from hostile Chinese trade sanctions. For example, after Canberra called for an independent investigation into the origins of COVID-19, China retaliated by imposing hefty tariffs on and barriers to Australian exports of barley, wine, timber, lobster, and coal. Australia and others, Lithuania as an example, would, uh, would such a trade NATO not be as vulnerable to Chinese economic coercion? Ladies and gentlemen, Europe didn't become uh, prosperous and influential by exporting gender mainstreamers or intersectional textile manufacturing. If we are to regain our relative wealth and might on the world stage, we need to be guided by principled realism. We need to build defense, energy, and trade alliances as we can't manage alone in the competition with Russian and Chinese imperialism. In other matters, we must once again trust the nation states and the Westphalian sovereign order. What made us prosperous was institutional competition between the states. So, it all starts at home, making it possible to pursue a meaningful foreign policy also means we have to find, fight woke identity politics and imperialist aspirations dressed up as EU federalism. We need to take demography and social cohesion seriously. It all starts with conservative patriotism, it all starts at gatherings like these. Thank you very much.